Okay, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Roshan Naik, I'm with the PGY fours. I'm gonna give the EMCCM lecture. Um, it's a little bit uh, long, so I try to kind of uh, go through it fast and you might not do it in the most typical EMCCM way, uh, but it's okay. Uh, so the case is a code 66 to the pediatric clinic because a 43 year old is feeling short of breath while they're with, the, uh, with her kid. Um, I want to thank the EMCCM team for helping me. Uh, so it's a code 66, uh, the code team arrives, they found a 43 year old who had a C-section 12 days ago for preeclampsia of its severe features, complaining of shortness of breath. Uh, the patient is tachycardic, hypoxic, tachypnic, only speaks in uh, single words, kind of sitting upright, uh, kind of uh, at, at the edge of the chair, and kind of in respiratory distress. And they put her on oxygen, they move her directly to CCT, she gets triaged inside uh, CCT, tachycardic to 147, very hypertensive, tachypnic, um, and hyp hypoxic, not febrile. On their initial uh, assessment, the airway is intact, but again, patient is in severe, uh, severe respiratory distress, is tachyp uh, tachypnic, also hypertensive, uh, well perfused, she's um, uh, diaphoretic, but she's not cold and clammy, uh, and uh, alert and oriented. Uh, so kind of primary problemless. Oh, I should have asked what the junior to say this, but it's fine. Uh, so you have somebody who is hypoxic, tachypnic, tachycardic, hypertensive, and you kind of all at, um, at this point have it in the back of your mind that also the patient is postpartum, like only 12 days out postpartum and the history of uh, preeclampsia. Uh, so the initial interventions, they also quickly obviously do a very quick exam. They listen to the lungs, they uh, hear like rails all the way to the uh, apex, they see JVD um, and uh, they call respiratory, they put the patient on BiPAP, they put the patient on cardiac monitor, get some basic labs and access, get an EKG. The patient can't fully tolerate um, BiPAP, so they gave her like one milligram of midazolam to kind of uh, help her tolerate BiPAP and after that she can uh, tolerate it fine. Um, with a basically clinical impression of um, APE in the setting of uh, high blood pressure, likely secondary to the uh, preeclampsia. And they start the patient on the nitroglycerin drip, they give some nitro paste, and they also um, give the patient uh, magnesium four gram in total, but it's not all given at the same time uh, for basically seizure prophylaxis. Uh, at this point, the patient is feeling a little bit better, so they can get a little bit more history, and the patient gave birth here, so they get to go and kind of do a little charge review. Chief complaint is shortness of breath. Uh, again, 43-year-old, status quo C-section for preeclampsia with severe features, 12 days ago, coming in, complaining of a couple of days of cough, runny nose, a little bit of viral symptoms, it's been going on for about two days, and today brought the kids to the pace clinic and uh, felt acutely dyspneic. Um, there. Uh, review of systems, pretty unremarkable, no fever, no bleeding, no discharge, no pain at the site of the C-section, um, no other abdominal pain, no headache, numbness, weakness, visual changes. Uh, the pregnancy history, patient is uh, G3, uh, P3L3. Uh, the last pregnancy was uh, basically C-section at 36 weeks for preeclampsia, uh, also had gestational diabetes, and was discharged on Lobotolol 200 milligram TID, which the patient is taking. Um, on exam, uh, this is the exam from when the patient arrives, it's all like in one note. The patient is acute distress, toxic appearing, diaphoretic, uh, atraumatic, <coughs> mucous membranes are moist, um, tachycardic with regular rhythm, normal pulses, diffuse bilateral rails all the way to the apex, and no chest wall tenderness, uh, no distension of the abdomen, soft, non-tender, C-section site looks clean, appropriate to being like 12 days. Um, out and then you know, cap refill with less than two seconds, bilateral uh, lower extremity edema present. Uh, there's no size difference between uh, the two legs. There's no calf tenderness and also extremities are warm. Uh, Noro exam patient is alert and oriented and in no, uh, it has no focal neurologic deficit list on the uh, exam uh, that they do. Um, so can somebody, can one of the juniors give me some differentials? Hello. Mm -hmm. Zahra. 
with preeclampsia in somebody who has a blood pressure this high and also has acute pulmonary edema is basically preeclampsia with severe features, right? Uh, any other differentials, Nadia? No, okay. Uh, anything else? Cardiomyopathy, peripartum cardiomyopathy. Um, so I, I, I think maybe think about it as things related to pregnancy versus things non-related to pregnancy, because we always tend to, when we see patients who are pregnant or immediately postpartum, and we only think about the, um, the complications of pregnancy or um, like preeclampsia, cardiomyopathy, those are all very good uh, differential diagnosis, but just kind of a reminder that pregnant women and postpartum women can also get other things. So kind of the general stuff that you would uh, uh, think about, the patient can have some, uh, um, primary take a dystrythmia, the patient can have pneumonia, they can have COVID because everybody can have COVID, or the patient can have myocarditis. Like one thing we uh, learned from COVID is to think of myocarditis a little bit more, uh, especially in the setting of a couple of days of URI symptoms. Uh, but yeah, I agree, preeclampsia with severe features is kind of uh, on top there, pre uh, prepartum cardiomyopathy. PE was in the differential. I think it is. Um, it should be considered like pre postpartum patients are at higher risk of PE than general population. Uh, do I think it's at the top of the differential? Probably not. Yes, the patient was taking cardiac and hypoxic, but that hypoxia quickly um, got better with oxygen. The patient doesn't have any sign of DVT. There are other diagnoses that are more likely and the, the hypertensive to, the, like the hypertension doesn't really go uh, with pulmonary embolism, but obviously in the differential. So on reassessment, uh, it was a little bit unclear from chart. It seems like they did very frequent reassessments, but they're not separate notes. So it's hard to see which vitals is which what uh, a reassessment. So, uh, but in the reassessment, the patient um, work of breathing improved, still a little bit tachycardic, but now speaks in full sentence says the blood pressure is now 134 over 91. Again, it was hard to see like, exactly. This, is, this, this reassessment is about an hour and a half into the course, but I'm pretty sure that the patient like this, you are, especially on the uh, nitro derp and the sick patient like this in CCT, you're probably in and out of the room of that patient. You're usually looking at the blood pressure every five to 10 minutes uh, at least. Um, a little bit still um, the kidney, and at this point, the FiO2 is decreased to 50%, um, and the patient is tapping 100% and BiPAP doing a lot better. Uh, this is the AKG. Um, like, nothing too exciting on it. There is like sinus tachycardia, there's some uh, PACs. The PR and QT intervals are normal. There is no big SDT changes, suggesting that this might be a STEMI. Um, there might be some electrical alternates. If you look at these, may or may not. Um, but then, oh, here. Uh, they also do that side ultrasound. Actually, they do this a little bit earlier than uh, like in the beginning. Uh, but these are all kind of done at the same time. Is this going to play or not? I don't know if you can see very well, but basically diffuse beelines all the way to the apex. They also documented bilateral pleural effusion, small, uh, but there is no clip for that. This is before QPath. Uh, so it's on the, um, I had to go get the, like the, this password, but there's definitely beelines there. Um, okay. This. Okay, and they also do an echo, which again, I'm not sure in this slide if you can see very well or not, uh, but there is decreased EF, uh, there is moderate to severe decreased EF, and then I'm not sure, if they, can you guys see this at all or is it too late? Okay, uh, so there is a, a pericardial effusion here. It's not tiny, it's not trace. Uh, it's decent size. Uh, and then whenever you see a pericardial effusion, especially in somebody's as a sick, you, your main question is that is this tamponade physiology or not? And clinically, the patient doesn't seem to have tamponade. Uh, there is um, no uh, hypotension. There is uh, no muscle heart signs. It's just clinically, it doesn't seem like the patient has tamponade. And then here, and, uh, you can basically look at the RV free wall in relation to the mitral valve and see if during diastole, if the uh, free wall of the RV collapses or not. That would be a ultrasound finding suggestive of 
possible physio uh, basically sonographic finding of tamponade. Uh, there is a very good email that recently Chris Hennison and also Lee sent out. It's a good clip, you can go look at that. But here you can see as the mitral valve is open, which is diastole, the RV ball is not really, at least not very convincingly collapsing. It's like a staying up. And if you kind of like slow that and look a little bit before, I have a hard time seeing from here. Uh, when the, uh, when the uh, mitral valve is also closed, the RV ball is kind of in the same place. Uh, so I reviewed this with the ultrasound faculty. Uh, they were basically saying that the, at least the clips that are safe are not very um, convincing to call this tamponade. And you can also put M mode and look at the R, uh, RV volume in relation to the MR, uh, mitral valve to see it better, or you can just slow this down and look at it. Uh, unfortunately, the M mode wasn't uh, documented. Um, the team that did the echo, uh, they basically read it as small pericardial effusion. Uh, they also um, were concerned that there is RV collapse uh, and uh, that they basically were concerned about tamponade. Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, further testing, there's some labs sent from uh, where, the, where the IV is placed. It's a little bit unclear to me why fibrinogen or D-dimer was sent. Maybe there was that uh, concern on differential P being on the differential and there's a D-dimer sent. Um, and then the patient also, OBGYN was involved from the beginning. Uh, the, there's no documentation saying it is a code 54, but I'm pretty sure it's a code 54 because from the beginning, from the triage note, there's also an OBGYN note. So they were probably present from the beginning. And then they also, after seeing the echo findings, they also called cardiology consult. Um, this is the X-ray basically showing kind of volume overload. There's like this bad thing pattern of uh, like pulmonary edema, uh, which is consistent with the um, findings on the uh, ultrasound. There's a little bit of uh, kind of blunting of the uh, angle here, maybe some pl uh, pleural effusion. Uh, so OBGYN, basically they say continue with the magnesium, keep the blood pressure below 160, uh, the over 110, strict INO, serial mag levels, and get cardiology and ICU uh, involved. Uh, their concern is that also at this point, peri um, peripartum cardiomyopathy in the setting of a preeclampsia with severe features. Labs are not really that exciting. I mean, good that they're not exciting. There's no thrombocytopenia, like things that we worry about in the preeclampsia -pre patient with severe features. There's no, um, there is no thrombocytopenia. The kidney function is okay. Uh, there is, uh, on the blood gas, there's no like other reads that there's no like, uh, CO2 retention, there's no acidosis. Uh, the labs look pretty okay. There's no, the hemoglobin is uh, at the ba at baseline. Um, the LFTs, there's a little bit of elevation of ALT, but it's not doubled. It's not enough to be uh, concerning for uh, liver dysfunction. The PTPTT INR is normal. There's a pro BMP that's elevated. The D dimer is positive. Um, and there's LDH and fibrinogen that, is, that are elevated. Uh, as well. Um, patient is also seen by cardiology. Cardiology is also concerned about pericardial cardiopathy. They're, they are concerned about pulmonary embolism, so they actually, the setting of that D-dimer asked for a CTA as well, and they want to get a formal echo uh, in the ED uh, because um, they are thinking of transferring the patient out because of the finding of tampon nod uh, on our ultrasound and also uh, to send, in case the patient got, gets worse, uh, to send them to a center with ECMO capabilities, LVAD tech capabilities, ICD placement tech capabilities, all the advanced, uh, more advanced treatments that the patient might need um, in like near future. Uh, and on their bedside ECMO, they, uh, before the, the formal TTE, they estimate the EF around 10 to 15%. So this is the CTA. Um, there is no, it is a little bit of a limited study due to suboptimal opacification of kind of distal pulmonary arteries, but there's no big PE. We can see the uh, pleural effusion here again. The heart is kind of largest cardio, uh, cardiomegaly. Uh, something I learned preparing for this lecture from Dr. Beda is that whenever you CTA or any CTA with contrast, if you do in a patient that's immediately postpartum, because they still have the volume expansion from pregnancy, you are gonna have a limited study because your contrast is just gonna get diluted that much. 
which I do not know. So uh, he was basically saying it's very typical of these patients to, to have a limited study on, on CTA, but there's no big PE that would explain all the symptoms. Um, a TTE is done like a formal TTE in the um, in CCT. The EF is less than 30%. There's moderate pericardial effusion, severe of the CVP. Um, and they also um, find findings concerning for tamponade uh, physiology. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure how convinced they were because there's also not recommendations that would go with that diagnosis. So if you're thinking somebody has tamponade, you probably shouldn't uh, drop their blood pressure too fast. They are preload dependent. You probably shouldn't drop your blood pressure too much. Maybe putting on BiPAP and increasing their intrathoracic pressure is not the best idea. It can it can make them worse. Uh, it's it's. I think it's more of something that they were concerned about, but it doesn't seem like the ED team or the or the cardiology team were so convinced that this is top or not that would act on it basically. Uh, or change the management, acute management of the patient based on it. Uh, so they basically, again, EF 10 to 15%, some concern for tamponade transfer to Bellevue, you basically is their recommendation. Um, so ED, the ED course, I just put this up because everything so happens so fast and kind of like appropriately fast. Uh, so um, this is kind of the uh, kind of the recap the case, 43 year old postpartum day, day 12 coming in, uh, which shortness of breath that acutely got worse, placed on BiPAP, given Lasix. I, I forgot to say before that they gave Lasix. They gave Lasix, they put on, um, they gave magnesium, nitroglycerin drip, nitro paste, and some were set for anxiety. Uh, GYN and cardiology were consulted. There is a TTE done with uh, reduced ejection fracture. And the first stroke was negative. The second one is what 0 0.02, so it uh, doubled. Uh, and uh, um, cardiology recommended a transfer. The patient was also started on a mag infusion for uh, four gram per hour uh, for um, basically uh, prophylaxis of seizure. And then patient was transferred to Bellevue Hospital to their CCU. Uh, so the final diagnosis as we're kind of like talking about it all around is prepartum cardiomyopathy in the setting of worsening preeclampsia with severe features. Uh, I'm not gonna go over preeclampsia too much just because there's not time. And also we recently had a lecture on it. Uh, but just to remind us of what preeclampsia with severe feature is. So preeclampsia with severe feature is either in like outpatient setting, if the systolic blood pressure is more than 160 over 110, twice four hours apart, or even once with severe features, including uh, any new onset neurologic symptoms, visual symptoms, uh, pulmonary edema, which this patient has, thrombocytopenia, uh, like LFDs more than double the normal upper limits of normal or persistent right upper quadrant pain and discomfort that cannot be explained by anything else uh, and worsening of kidney function without any identifying cause in somebody who doesn't have uh, previous kidney disease. Which for our patient like a pulmonary edema is there, the blood pressure is definitely there. Um, I wanna more focus on part of uh, cardiomyopathy. Um, Prevalent, so pericardial uh, cardiomyopathy by uh, definition is um, basically cardiomyopathy within uh, like close to um, de delivery time. Basically it's one month, uh, the last month of pregnancy up to five months after. Uh, some guidelines don't have that, like those timelines on it. They just say any cardiomyopathy without any identifiable cause that happens around the time of delivery. But most of them are in the last month of um, pregnancy until one month after uh, delivery, uh, but up to five months, you can still call it peri uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy as long as you cannot find any identifiable cause for their reduced EF. And by definition, their EF needs to be less than 45%. Uh, the prevalence and risk factors in the US, it is one in 1000 live birth, uh, depending on which study you look at. Um, maternal age more than 30 is a risk factor, so yay for some of us. Uh, Multigestational pregnancies, preeclampsia or eclampsia, and also um, black race. I put the asterisk there because I want to kind of come back to that. Uh, more than 90% of patients with preeclampsia or eclampsia never develop uh, prepartum cardiomyopathy, uh, but of, 
of patients who have peripartum cardiomyopathy, up to 20% of them had history of preeclampsia or eclampsia either in this pregnancy or in prior pregnancies. Um, so that is important, especially in the emergency room, if you have a patient that is in that time frame coming in with some, because the, the findings can be very non-specific. A patient like one month postpartum can come and say, I'm tired, I don't have energy, I'm a little bit short of breath. And by the way, my previous pregnancy, I had preeclampsia. So th that patient, you might just, under normal circumstances, you might just say, well, you just gave birth, you're tired. This is probably normal, but like, if with, uh, for us, especially having ultrasound at our disposal, the kind of like thinking about this uh, more high risk patients and thinking about this might be a cardiomyopathy because the, the, it does, I mean, I'm gonna get to it, but it does often diagnose late. And the later you diagnose the prognosis can be worse. Um, the incidence worldwide is very different depending on which country you are looking at. Uh, it goes from one, to one in 200 uh, live birth in uh, Nigeria and Haiti and China. Uh, and um, th those are like the highest rate. But again, these are from different studies. So I didn't see any national database from these countries like saying it is, like it's actually that high. But from the studies that are available, it is as high as one in 200 uh, live birth. But then you look at like a country like Japan, uh, it has a prevalence of one in 20,000. Or you look at the Scandinavian countries is one in 10,000, which makes me think um, how much is it actually, which is why I put the asterisk there, how much of this is actually Grace being a risk factor as opposed to access to care and being able to be diagnosed uh, early, um, which we'll get to a little bit later. Uh, I don't want to get too much into pathophysiology for two, three reasons. First, it's not very well understood, so nobody really knows the exact pathophysiology. Two, because it's not really that relevant to us, it's super complicated and I don't understand it. Uh, and uh, three, um, it's but just complicated and just doesn't really serve us much to know the exact pathophysiology. But the reason I put it up is that prolactin uh, because there are some new treatments or newish treatments uh, looking to see if like um, giving bromocryptin, which is a prolactin inhibitor actually can be used as a treatment for peripartum cardiomyopathy. They believe that uh, it has some role in kind of causing this cascade that then leads to oxidative stress that then leads to uh, cardiomyocyte apopt apoptosis and death. Uh, but again, they used to think it is a viral myocarditis in patients who have uh, some dis genetic predisposition, but that kind of got debunked. They still think there might be some genetic predispositions because they have found some families that with clusters of prepartum cardiomyopathies, but it's still very much unclear what exact pathophysiology is. So diagnostic, the diagnostic criteria we went uh, over, it's important that the patient doesn't have an identifiable cause for the heart failure. Uh, the presentation, most, ca that most cases present with symptoms that you, we all associate with um, uh, heart failure, dyspnea on exertion, orthopnea, PND, uh, lower extremity edema. Delay in diagnosis is very common and um, actually, um, poor per, uh, it's a poor prognostic factor. So the later you diagnose it, the worse those patients do. In terms of pro, uh, other prognostic factor, the first echo of the patient is really important. Patients whose first echo, the EF is less than 30%, like our patient, that's a poor prognostic factor. If in the first echo, the, uh, the left ventricle is very dilated and the left ventricle end, end diastolic diameter is more than six centimeter, that is a poor prognostic factor. In our patients, it was 5.1 centimeters, so it wasn't quite that high. Uh, and also there is black race is a uh, poor prognostic factor, again, the asterisk, and also presence of fibrosis in the cardiac MRI. Um, again, the reason I put that asterisk there is that I couldn't find any real evidence anywhere that actually can, uh, can prove that the race itself is a risk factor because there is no study that actually looks at uh, patients from like different races and then uh, accounts for all the different factors and kind of narrows it down to race, especially um, being diagnosed late, being a poor prognosis factor, prognostic factors makes me think if, um, if access to healthcare if, um, is, is a factor, if um, which provider and which setting the patients are being seen in is a factor, 
uh, if the unconscious and conscious biases that we have in medicine is a factor. Um, so that's why I put the asterisk there because I felt like it, I just couldn't find enough data to say that race itself is a risk factor uh, or prognostic factor. Um, in terms of prognosis, uh, 50 to 80% of patients actually recover to an EF of 50% uh, after six months. And the reason for that being is that we have um, gotten better at treating heart failure in general. And the treatment of these patients is pretty similar to treatment of uh, other heart failure patients. Uh, still 1.5% of them need uh, mechanical circulatory support and 0.5% of them need transplant. In terms of complications, the most common complications is um, LV uh, thromb uh, thrombus because of low EF. And that's why they put these patients, if they have an EF of less than 30%, they put them on anticoagulation. Uh, thromboembolic uh, embolic events are uh, five to nine percent, cardiogenic shock and cardiac arrest is like around two to three percent, and uh, one year mortality in the United States is four to eleven percent. Um, the reason some of these numbers don't fully add up is that they're they're all coming from different studies and not like a big national database. Uh, in terms of treatment, um, in terms of treatments, the most important thing is that if these patients, if they're acutely sick in cardiogenic shock, the treatment is very similar to patient that is not pregnant uh, or the patient that's not prepartum, uh, postpartum, sorry, um, because few studies are actually performed on these patients specifically. So a lot of treatment guidelines actually come from heart failure uh, guidelines and not necessarily from patients with prepartum cardiomyopathy. And then uh, on the like preeclampsia and eclampsia, delivery hasn't been shown to actually improve the outcome or make these patients better. So it's not like eclampsia or preeclampsia um, pre that we control their seizure, we blood, bring their blood pressure down, and then we try to send them up to, uh, to, to possibly have a C-section. And in these patients, it's actually the more you can make the mom stable, you're helping that pregnancy in general and delivery is not a treatment. Um, in terms of, uh, if you have a patient that is pregnant, it is important to get all services that are gonna be involved in the care of that patient uh, involved because the, the care for these patients is complicated. So you want your OBGYN to be there. Uh, you want cardiology to be involved, possible ICU. If you have an ED pharmacist, get them involved. Uh, if you have uh, maternal, um, maternal fetal medicine, get them involved. So these are complicated patients, get all the services that you need involved. Uh, in terms of treatment, the only um, thing that is different is uh, safety of medication in pregnancy and lactation. Loop diuretics, beta blocker, hydrolysine, nitrate, digoxin are both safe in both pregnancy and lactation. Uh, ACE inhibitor, ARBs, uh, aldosterone receptor inhibitors, and Tresto, warfarin are not, are not safe in pregnancy. Some of the ACE inhibitors and ARBs can be given during lactation. Espiroloctin can be used um, is safe um, for lactation. And Tresto, there is no data available. So for patients that actually need it, sometimes they tell them to stop breastfeeding or they give them uh, bromocryptin to stop breastfeeding uh, and then they give it if that is the only option. Um, you can give warfarin during lactation, uh, but if the patient is pregnant, no molecular uh, beta heparin is the way to go. If the patient has an EF of less than 30 to 35 the percent, depending if you're looking at AHA guidelines versus European guidelines. Um, Sorry. And then, as I said, there, there are studies about bromocryptin thinking like with the thought process of uh, kind of stopping that uh, prolactin, blocking that prolactin might actually slow down the progression of disease, but the studies are not very conclusive. They're like very small studies and none of them are super conclusive. Uh, so of course, for these patients, if the patient arrives in CCU, on arrival to CCU, she's still a little bit more, uh, a little bit tachycardic. The blood pressure is 152 over 105. Uh, has one episode of fever there on arrival. Um, they do a full exam, they don't find any source. So they decide to send cultures, blood cultures, urine cultures, all of that, and uh, hold off on an antibiotic. And the patient never spikes a fever again. Uh, but there is a 103 that's his um, document. The patient is noted to be calm in no acute distress, uh, breathing is not labored, uh, and not noted to have lower extremity edema. Um, the patient is weaned off of BiPAP. The magnesium is DC'd. Um, 
at this point, I think the patient has been on magnesium for about uh, nine, 10 hours. Uh, the OBGYN there actually recommends Kepra, uh, Q12 for 24 hours for seizure prophylaxis. And nitro drip is continued at this time because they, they try to stop it and then the uh, blood pressures go back up. Um, and cultures are sent, troponin is sent. This is high sensitivity troponin and then trended day one is kind of down trending. And the patient has um, multiple other EKGs that are all kind of the same. Um, there's no changes. Day two, uh, the drip is discontinued. They do, uh, on day one on arrival, they do a bedside echo and they see the effusion, it's a small, they don't see any tamponade physiology. On day two, they get a formal echo. Uh, there is no RV collapse. EF is around 30% and there's grade two diastolic dysfunction, um, moderate mitral and tricuspid regurgitation. Day four, the, all the cultures come back completely negative. And then day five, the patient is actually deceased on uh, frozen myometoprolol and allopril spironolactone and nifedipine. They have a discussion with the patient about breastfeeding cessation to be able to give entresto. Patient is not interested in that and prefers to go on other medications and kind of follows up. Um, on follow up, at one month, seen OBGYN clinic compliant with medication, is feeling fine. At two months and six months, goes back to cardiology, is taking the home meds. At two months, they they rediscuss and trust though the patient is not interested in that. And at six months, actually they do another echo and the EF is normalized, patient's asymptomatic and doing well. So there's some happy ending here. So this is the echo at five months, the EF is 55 to uh, 60%. It is pretty remarkable because this patient had at least uh, two, of, two to three of those poor prognostic factors. The EF on arrival was less than 30%, the age um, and uh, and she's African-American, if we, if we say that's an actual uh, risk factor. Uh, but it's pretty remarkable that she uh, kind of, uh, the EF normalized. Uh, these are my references. Sorry, I went, if I went through all, everything fast, I kind of wanted to leave some time for questions. And questions. Oh, so many. Go, go ahead. Anybody? So the transfer was, multiple reasons. There were some concern that if the patient worsens being in the facility that has capabilities for ECMO, LVAD, ICD placement is probably beneficial to the patient. That possible finding of tamponade, again, it doesn't seem like they were super concerned about that because surgery, city surgery here wasn't involved. It doesn't seem like they changed their management based off of that. Um, but that was also another reason of okay, we also have this finding and also this probably this probably this patient is served better in that facility having those services. So I think it was a combination of everything. You mentioned that for uh, postpartum cardiomyopathy, delivery is important. Like initially when the patient goes out, you can see like very Yes. Um, so this patient is postpartum. So this patient already had delivery like right, 12 right. days ago for I guess in a pregnant patient, mm -hmm. they pass that yeah. for like 34 weeks where they're still undifferentiated. What if they have pre if if they have preeclampsia with severe features, that is an indication, obviously if it's like you get your vigilant involved, but that is an indication for possible delivery. If they are only Periparton cardiomyopathy, meaning that they don't have signs of consist like the, the blood pressure is not high, they but they have low EF, uh, and you are thinking like cardiomyopathy, then it is not an immediate indication for delivery. You can get the mom more stable. Obviously, again, you get OBGYN and every other service involved, uh, but actually, it is better to make the mom's uh, cardiac function better before going for, yeah, it's, it's not like preeclampsia that delivery in itself, like C-section itself is a kind of a treatment because the pathophysiology is a little bit different even though they don't completely understand it. Yes. Uh, and this is a code 54. So it is not documented that it's a code 54 in this case, but I'm pretty sure it was because they were literally the OBGYN note is before the RIPN note. And our IPN notice says like the patient is here, OBGYN is at the bedside. This is definitely a code 54 because of hypertension with severe features, history of preeclampsia. 
the uh, prepartum cardiomyopathy, it is not mentioned in the code 54, but if I remember it correctly, any patient that is pregnant or prepartum, if they have uh, life-threatening things, it's 54, but I'm not, I'm not sure for postpartum. I would say if a patient is pregnant and don't have like preeclampsia, but have prepartum cardiomyopathy, that would, that would make them a, a sick, late pregnancy, like a pregnant patient that is sick and probably needs like ICU level of care. And I think that is actually post 54. I, I have to go back and look at SharePoint. I don't know about postpartum though, but I would say I would definitely get a OBGYN involved, like post 54 or not. <laughs> Uh, 24 hours is definitely uh, indicated. Uh, the, when you bring their blood pressure down, usually that's when they stop. But 24 hours is usually the recommendation. But the, the ACOG recommendation is 24 hours at least. And then you give four, this is for preeclampsia with, with severe fissure, or uh, you give like four or four grams in the beginning, which in our institution is a little bit hard because they come in piggy bags. So like slamming them with four grams, actually not that practical. Uh, but you have to give four gram in the beginning, and then you do. If you decide to put them on the drip, it would be four gram every hour. Is it why they stopped? No, they didn't. Uh, they didn't. There's just an OBGYN note from like NYU uh, that we recommend Kepra for the rest of the 24 hours. I'm actually a little bit like it's yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. but yeah. There's no documentation of like MAG toxicity. There's no doc documentation that there was, oh, the patient is developing like some symptoms that we need to stop it. And it's just a recommendation that they get. Yes. Yeah, I guess in this patient, I wouldn't actually think about tampon out based on their presentation. I don't think anything in their clinical presentation goes with tampon out. If I saw an ultrasound finding that wouldn't go with my clinical, if I was really convinced that this is tampon out, um, meaning if they had like clinical signs of tampon out and then I had the ultrasound finding that was really concerning, then I would probably decrease, I mean, uh, decrease their blood pressure a little bit with more cost because you don't want to bottom them out either because they are preload dependent or you don't want to probably increase their intrathoracic pressure. Um, so I would be a little bit more cautious about that. Uh, but I am not, I, I don't think this patient had clinical findings of tampon. And it doesn't seem like from any of the notes that any management was changed or any recommendation was given specifically for tampon. So I'm not even sure, I'm not sure if like the teams were actually really convinced that this is tampon. And then when he, she arrived in NYU, their bedside echo didn't show it. And then the next day one didn't show it. I just feel like a lot of times with our cardiology, uh, we kind of create kind of a diagnostic momentum. I feel like whenever we have called it tamponat on ultrasound, they also agree with us, which is good that they have so much trust in us. But um, also I feel like it's, I, 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 I'm not sure. I don't have their images because it's not uploaded to Epic. To put that up and see how much they looked. You would still decrease the blood pressure, probably, but not like a little bit slower and be cautious. Yeah, yeah, if it's like. Yes. What are the what? Sorry. So there was a there was an echo that was on my bedside echo that shows the cardiac effusion, and then there is some kind like in the interpretation it says concern for RV collapse. The images that are saved at least doesn't show a very convincing collapse. Uh, I reviewed it with ultrasound faculty as well. Uh, they didn't think it is convincing enough 
to call this like uh, ultrasound finding of tamponade. I wanted to include a few slides on like ultrasound findings of tamponade, but that's a whole other lecture. And I didn't want to take away from the perpartum cardiomyopathy one. I can send it out because I literally have them in the slides. Any? Yeah. In, so I think the transfer is not necessarily just for ECMO. It is all like the patient might end up needing LVAD or transplant or even ICD placement, like all the things that we don't really do in this institution. So I don't think it's the it has, I don't think it's patient, it was wrong to transfer them because they might get worse and they might need those services. And it is not like, it's not the worst idea to send them to somewhere that has some of those capabilities, at least. In terms of like management, again, most of them do well. Um, I think like the severe complications, which are like the cardiac arrest, dysrhythmias, most of the cardiac arrests are from dysrhythmia, that from like uh, ventricular dysrhythmias uh, or needing transplants or needing ECMO are all within like one to two percent to of like up to I think the, the data that I saw like the highest probability was like 2.6 percent and uh, most of them do fine I would say if they are on they are very unstable and they're not really responding if they're in cardiogenic shock and not really responding to your treatments then that's is, then I would start talking point is it the worst idea to send them to a center before they get worse that has all those capabilities I honestly don't think so if I had it, which I hope I don't, I prefer to be somewhere that has those capabilities, to be completely honest. Yes, uh, as you said, it's a predicted disease that uh, you can have to cover the And I think it's a little bit different in like New York City where you can just transfer them to a center as opposed to if you're working in a state that you have to send them to like two states over with helicopter to be in that. It's a little bit different. So we have that luxury of having those services within the city and within. The the system. Kind of yeah, it's, it's hard to argue Not with that. What? We are recording this. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Any comments from the okay? Let me see if the chat is there's the chat. Any questions or comments from the audience at home? Seems not. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, this is the, and for people on Zoom, this is the end of conference. Enjoy the rest of your day. Huh? Uh, if I'm gonna get, yes, thank you for, no, that was a really good lecture. Thank you. How do I? That was awesome. I am so technologically challenged. How do I go back to Zoom? Where's, where's the rest of Zoom? Uh, it, but go down to the bottom of the screen. It's only there. So, oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I'm sounding like an idiot. Where is it? Stop share. Yeah. yeah. And was there anything in the chat? Let's see what the alternate is. Well, I did say the first.